I'm going to just tell you what the plans are for today and next week as well. And then I'll proceed with my lecture. At the end of this class, as usual, we'll watch this time an entire silent film, which is not too long. So, for this week, we have, under week seven, two topics, two readings. One is excerpts from what apparently is the first Italian play on the theme of the automobile and the mania for the automobile, Alfredo Testoni's In Automobile on the automobile, although I translated it in my forthcoming translation as automobile rides. Then we have a series of sonnets by the same Italian author from 1908, devoted to the theme of the automobile, seen through the eyes of a woman from Bologna who was born before these technologies were introduced in society in the 19th century. At the end of the class, we will see a French silent movie, which is one of the most interesting from this period. It came out in 1905, although there was a previous version made in 1904. Keep in mind that next week, I will be spending a lot of time talking about the final project and the methodology and the template for the final project and doing some work with you, demoing the features and the process of finding documents for the final project. So make an effort to be present, although, as usual, YouTube videos will be provided. And even later on, if you forget about some details related to the project, you can still go back to those videos. Okay? Are, the, are all the people in the classroom with me, or do we have people who are virtually absent? Yes, probably. Thank you. Okay. I hope you're not just coming to sign the attendance, right? That would be the idea. Okay, so. I would say make an effort to be here next week because those classes are essential for you to get started on the project, to understand the nature of the project. It's not a paper, it's an archival research kind of project. Um, on Sunday, last Sunday, I had the concorso at Stony Brook, so usually I review and grade your assignments on Saturday morning. Saturday morning, I was busy with the preparations for the concorso, which means that, don't worry, I haven't forgotten. Just wait until this Saturday when I will go back, open all the files, and review and grade those assignments. Same for the notes you wrote last Thursday. I still have to review them. And what I have in here are instead notes that weren't picked up last week. So if you didn't, make sure to look for your name here. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the characters and the themes of this Italian play that was staged in Rome in June of 1904. And it was even marketed as the first Italian play on the automobile. There were a lot of plays during the first decade of the 20th century about the automobile, the mania for the automobile, the addiction to speed, the automobile as a much desired item of consumption. And Italy was just one of the countries represented in that new group of uh, plays. There were many plays in France. France was probably during this period uh, the, the place that produced most plays on this theme. And of course, the 
England and the US as well in the US uh, around this time there is even a musical on the subject of the Vanderbilt Cup races a lot of these um, shows included real cars shown on the stage sometimes especially in uh, American theaters those cars were actual cars and they would be the, the engines would be turned on during the play because it was a nice trick often um, celebrities uh, such as race car drivers would be invited and placed on the stage during those uh, plays and some of those plays were translated and circulated in several countries that is often the case for the French plays that were translated in Italian as well as English. So the year is 1904. The playwright was a man by the name of Alfredo Testoni, who by 1904 was fairly successful, had already enjoyed a few hits was mostly writing uh, plays that were entertaining, right? They were not supposed to be a high art form. Keep in mind that during this period, a lot of people, not just the middle and upper classes, went to theater frequently. There was no TV, no radio yet, and people were enjoying all kinds of shows. Often these plays reflected trends that existed in society so that people would be able to connect to what they were uh, seeing on stage. At the same time, especially during this period in the history of <clears throat> Italian society, the plays also served an educational purpose. And in the notes that you find at the end of the excerpts for this play, you find a few details about the history of Italy. In 1904, Italy was still a very young nation that uh, uh, was partially unified as the Kingdom of Italy in 1861. Without the city of Rome, and the surrounding region, which was added only in 1870. Okay? And the process of uh, national unification would actually be continuing, the borders of Italy continue to adjust with World War I and World War II. So, theatre for a young nation trying to establish its national identity also served an important educational purpose and a secondary educational function performed by theater was that to educate viewers spectators to the new national language because Italy although it had a long literary tradition did not have an official national language until the years after the first unification, the 1860s. So a lot of people in 1904, in 1904 had limited school education. A lot of people could not even read. And most people spoke their local dialect as their primary language and were somewhat fluent in the new national language. So keep in mind that there are aspects in here that clearly show the intention of the author to change the minds of the spectators, spread the support, the, the, the certain values that were considered <clears throat> national values. So I will be talking about the 
main characters of the play, their profile, their situation, their manias, and then also their goals and the trajectory they follow during the story of the play. At the very center of the play, we find a young lawyer by the name of Emilio. And Emilio then interacts in different ways with the rest of the characters who are part of his social circle. The play takes place in Florence during the spring, around the month of May. So it could be 1902 or 1903. That would be the time of the story. As I said, the play was staged in 1904 the first time and it was published twice in the following years by Zanichelli, a publisher in Bologna. So Emilio is the center of this circle. It is also the center of the story. All the various threads in the story go through Emilio. The very first act of the play takes place in fact inside Emilio's office or offices. There are several rooms. He has two clerks working with him. And those offices are in a building where he also has his apartment. This is clearly not just any lawyer. It's an upper class wealthy lawyer. It's interesting to note that the principal, the main character in the play, is someone who does not have an automobile, has no desire to get one, and lives above his office, so doesn't need to move much to get from his apartment to his office. He is married with a younger woman named Lina, and as I said, the rest of the character are the characters are his friends. The reason why a character with no automobile is found at the center of the story in a play about the automobile is that the automobile and the mania for the automobile in this play serves simply as a metaphor for the need of a balance in anyone's life, that is to say, the need to reject any strong urge, whether it be to purchase a high and expensive, uh, high price and expensive item such as the automobile, or other urges of a romantic nature or of a sexual nature. So Emilio represents the positive message of the play by rejecting the new technology, which can be overwhelming in terms of any kind of rational consideration, right? You try the automobile, you feel the speed, and then you want one, you want to use one. Uh, and therefore, you cannot control that particular urge. Emilio is a secular professional that is also important in terms of offering models for this play for a young society such as the Society of uh, Italy during this time. And we know that he is a secular professional because at some point during the first act, he is criticized for entertaining all kinds of customers, even customers who are actual criminals or customers who have done things that society would consider to be immoral or amoral. But he responds by saying that a lawyer has to work with all kinds of clients. That is to say, there cannot be any moral barrier even for an upper class lawyer, right? So, for example, the suggestion, the implication would be that he could, if need be, 
defend prostitutes, for example, or simple thieves, because that is part of his profession. A professional lawyer in a modern society cannot be driven by moralistic values and therefore uh, send away certain customers. So Emilio is in his office and he receives a number of visits. Two of his friends come by. One is Baron Ferrucci, who is the owner of automobiles. Yes, and Madison. Emilio, you said Emilio was in this context this almost presented as a sort of national ideal for Italy due to his rejection of this almost new indulgent technology. But is he considered, is he shown in a flawed light through his acceptance of all clientele regardless of background? Or is this almost seen as a flaw of his, indicating perhaps some moral failing, at least in the context of this period? What would be a flaw? His rejection of technology? No, or... um, his acceptance of all people. No, no, no. It shows that he is a truly modern professional, ah, okay. driven by a pragmatic view of life. And therefore, in the context of Italy, as it is developing as an independent nation during those years, it represents the rejection of the traditional religious values. It's the incarnation of the separation between church and state, which was, uh, especially in Italy, particularly difficult in the past, right? So he, in fact, is also presented as an atheist virtually, even though his wife is very religious. So uh, he, he certainly not intolerant of religion, but doesn't embrace religion at all. He thinks that religion belongs to the past. It's the idea that a modern, efficient, well-working society cannot be influenced by values of the past, such as excessive moralism, which for a lawyer would be, as I said before, I refuse to defend a prostitute because I condemn prostitution. And therefore, this prostitute is a sinner, should not be a customer of, of mine. Otherwise, my reputation as a member, as a good member of society, would be tarnished. That's not at all how Emilio operates. And that presents a positive model to the spectators. Don't let certain values influence your efficiency in your workplace. You can go to church on Sunday, but if you work as a lawyer, you welcome all kinds of customers and you defend them even though you may uh, uh, object to what they did, right? So that's an important step in the development of a new national society. Okay. So Emilio is visited by two friends. The first one is Baron Ferrucci. Ferrucci owns several automobiles and is taken by the mania for the automobiles and uh, completely fallen for automobiles. He admits to that. He has no other moral flaws. He doesn't have a lover that we know of in the play like several of the other characters. But certainly, he is completely taken by this mania. The other friend is Count Rossetti. Um, by the way, Ferrucci is married to uh, Grazia, who is another of Emilio's friend. Rossetti is a bachelor is younger than Ferrucci, who's also older than Emilio. And Rossetti is a Don Juan, is a womanizer, and is known as such in his circle. Rossetti, at some point before the beginning of the play, 
has borrowed one of Ferrucci's automobiles because his own automobile was not working. He went out of town, out of Florence, and during his trip on the automobile, apparently caused some damages. He hurt a dog owned by a farmer. Allegedly, he crashed the dog's legs. He hit, it's a fictional dog. No actual animals were hurt in the performance of this play. And Rossetti himself will declare that when he left the scene of the alleged accident, the dog was in perfectly good, healthy conditions, and the claim is uh, completely unfounded, just a way to get money from him with the lawsuit. So there is a cyclist who says that he was hit by Rossetti's automobile. So as a result of his trip, there are several people who are suing the owner of the car, who happens to be Ferrucci. Ferrucci would like to avoid paying those, uh, those lawsuits, and Rossetti was not alone. So there is a potential eyewitness, if indeed the dog was not hurt. If indeed the cyclist was merely pushed to the ground but not crashed by the car, the other person on the car could testify to that and they would have a chance to resolve the legal issues, avoid the lawsuits. However, the person who was on the automobile with Count Rossetti, uh, this, this playboy, aristocratic playboy was a woman and this woman is married and therefore she doesn't want to testify because she would have to publicly declare that she was with a single man on a trip outside of town and therefore in a situation that would somewhat impact on her honor, on her reputation, on her image. And we learn during the first act that this woman is, in fact, Renata, married to another lawyer who's a friend of Emilio by the name of Carlo. Okay? So we know what their situation is. We know that compared to Emilio, these characters also lack balance. Keep in mind, the automobile in here is seen negatively simply because it introduces or upsets the psychological and balance and therefore the social efficiency of the characters. All the characters around Emilio are either flawed with some powerful urge or mania or are subject to temptations, whereas Emilio is the positive model of someone who has enough self-control, who is less Italian and more European in terms of social identity. Okay. <coughs> so Ferrucci's mania is, or weakness is the automobiles and the addiction to speed. Rossetti's mania, manias are in a smaller way automobiles themselves, in a bigger way women, right? Rossetti is pursuing Renata and at the end will end up with another woman forced by the circumstances to marry her. During the first act, Emilio receives a visit also by Angelo, who's the oldest character, an aristocrat, a Florentine aristocrat, a traditional aristocrat, and the representative of the party that is supporting the monarchy in Italy, so a conservative party. And he comes to Emilio to uh, apologize because Emilio is running for the elections of the city council, but of course <coughs> he is running on the left 
side of the political spectrum because as we said he is not religious not a supporter of the church in any form and also someone who is a supporter of democracy and therefore not a big supporter of the monarchy in Italy more of a reformist almost a socialist in the way that socialists could be in Europe during the uh, beginning of the 20th century promoting progress through reforms and Angelo himself although a conservative is being tempted by the new mania for speed he doesn't have an automobile but would like to have one and by the end of the play will very much enjoy a ride in one therefore because of this Angelo himself lacks some balance another visit that takes place in Emilio's office these people come and go in and out of the office is by Renata who's younger than Emilio married to Carlo who's another lawyer and Emilio's friend and Renata after much hesitation tells Emilio that she was the woman in Rossetti's car and she's afraid that there will be a scandal if this comes out so she wants Emilio to persuade Ferrucci and Rossetti to pay no matter how much is being asked because of those lawsuits by the farmer by the cyclist they should pay because otherwise if they call her to testify in front of the judge the other lawyer will uh, play the card that she's a married woman etc will try to uh, put her in a negative light right will try to uh, take credibility off of her potential testimonial uh, report or account of what happened by suggesting that she was in a morally ambiguous or negative kind of situation in the company of a single man whom everyone knows to be a uh, womanizer okay so uh, she's very nervous she will also tell Emilio that one of the reasons she accepted the invitation by Rossetti who's clearly pursuing her romantically is that she thinks that her husband Carlo has a mistress and therefore she, she, she feels she's being mistreated by her husband and reacting in this way uh, by letting Rossetti take her out for a trip although she then realizes the enormity of what she has done because once they go out of town well, on this automobile the automobile will break but it's just a ruse and Rossetti will tell her we have to have dinner together here so what was supposed to be just a short trip out of town becomes a trip and a dinner and then the car is broken so uh, Rossetti takes a room above the inn where they have dinner and so now they're spending the night not together not in the same room but in the same place which opens up to the possibility of uh, a, a sexual affair right Renata realizes what she has done and she convinces Rossetti to take her back uh, to Florence after the dinner so they don't spend the night but Renata uh, is, is nonetheless in a very compromising situation right and she would like to know who Carlo's mistress is because this way even if Carlo knew about what she did with Rossetti that would be about even she hasn't done anything she doesn't really need to be forgiven by her husband but she's willing to forgive her husband's infidelity in exchange for keeping the marriage going right? you understand the situation so if Ferrucci's weakness was the mania for the automobile as it is for Angelo and Rossetti's weakness and lack of balance in life was for Rossetti was women in the case of Renata 
we once again have the idea of a romantic liaison and the automobiles as witnesses, right? She clearly reacted very strongly in a physical way to the experience of riding on the automobile. That had a strong impact on her psychologically. That is to say, she found herself in a situation where she almost lost control because the intensity of the automobile ride, the idea of being in a place where no one knows her, and therefore there is the possibility of the affair to become sexual, is too much for her. Meaning that what she was looking for was to have a man around her that would give her more attention than her husband. She didn't really want to pursue this any farther. She just wanted to receive attentions that she wasn't getting, getting in the home. Yes? No, sorry, I was just, uh, sorry, I, I, I missed the part you had before that. She I can to repeat. More time. Yeah, okay, thank you. She wanted to spend more time with, uh, was it, I'm going to push it again, I'm sorry. It's absolutely fine. Ross City. Ross City. The but okay, however you say. Um, and what was the situation with Carlo again? I know that's a husband. I don't want to double check on that. So, Carlo is a lawyer like Emilio, a modern kind of lawyer, and he, is, he has an affair. He's having an affair with a young widower, widow, oh, okay. by the name of Elena. And Renata isn't sure about this, but she suspects that he is having an affair, and she would like to know which one of the women in her circle is the mistress so that she can uh, remedy her situation, right? Yeah. Because she found herself in a compromising situation. She cannot deny that she went out of town with a young playboy, had dinner with him, and almost spent the night out. And she's willing to forgive Carlo if Carlo will forgive her for uh, putting herself in that kind of situation and therefore uh, damaging her reputation possibly, potentially, okay? But again, in, in terms of the characters around Emilio look for their weakness or their lack of balance, their mania, because that serves to develop the idea that technologies control you, that in order for the whole society to work efficiently and in a balanced way, you need to exercise self-control and technologies stand in the way of that as much as extramarital affairs, sexual desires, etc especially sexual desires uh, outside of the marriage. In fact, the two characters that represent the dangers of sexual desire outside of marriage are Rossetti, who's still single, and Elena, who's, who as a widow doesn't have a man in her life to control her and to ensure that she behaves, right? And by the end of the comedy, Rossetti and Elena will be forced to marry each other, to neutralize them, to neutralize their disruptive action in society. Okay, and it's important to notice, as I said before, that even at the end of the comedy, Emilio will not change his mind about the automobile and will not express any desire to get one. Yes, Madison. Elena was the one I was married to, Emilia. No, no. That Elena is a widow. Oh, that's Lina? I'm sorry. Lina is married to Emilia. Okay. Grazia is married to Ferrucci. Renata is married to Carla. I see. Okay. Of course, not that you have to remember all those details, but just to understand, because this is a social play, right? Not much is going on, other than what changes in the relationships of the character with each other. There is no story really outside of that. It's this kind of bourgeois comedy that was very popular at the beginning of the 20th century. Okay? So, 
I can proceed or summarize again, explain, clarify, let me know. Okay, so uh, I've already said enough about Carlo. Carlo's lack of balance or weakness comes from the fact that instead of giving Renata the attention and the respect she deserved, he entertained an extramarital affair with Elena. However, now Elena and Carlo are going through a problematic period because Elena wants more from Carlo. Not that she would like to get married, there is no divorce in this kind of society, but Elena would like more time and more attention from Carlo, which pushes Carlo back to his wife. Meantime, however, Carlo's lack of attention to Renata pushed her in a potentially critical or scandalous situation. Lina is the young wife of Emilio, and her weakness is religion or faith. She has a very strong faith. She's very attached to the church. Uh, she has uh, um, a priest in particular that she admires so much that she convinces Emilio, who's practically an atheist and a socialist or an, a radical in politics, to write a booklet of poems to honor this preacher, this particular priest uh, that Lina admires so much. The other weakness, the other area in which Lina's character displays a lack of proper healthy balance is love itself. That is to say, she's very faithful, no affairs, and Emilio himself, after marriage, has been faithful to Lina. However, she loves Emilio too much. Uh, she always has some public display of affection that irritates Emilio because he considers it excessive in the presence of other people, right? So in this, in the ideolo in the ideology behind the play, even excessive love within marriage is considered a lack of a healthy balance. And during this period, and the, and the period leading to this play at the end of the 19th century, you find a lot of books, some by doctors, insisting <clears throat> on the hygiene of marriage, books that pro provided um, limited sexual education to their reader, but also the idea of the hygiene of marriage was that moderation had to be used in everything to produce a healthy relationship, including passion and sex, sex itself. During the same period, there is another play based on this very theme, where a couple where he is a stockbroker and an investor. And uh, uh, she, of course, as an upper-class woman, is a stay-home <coughs> wife. Uh, he lives a very tense life, a lot of stress, right? Because he has these big investments to take care of and has to generate profit, etc. And she insists on having sex all the time. And there is a doctor who comes to the stage to speak to her and tell her, you have to be careful because you'll have a nervous breakdown. It's very uh, under a lot of pressure because of this. And by the end of the play, he is admitted into a mental hospital because the wife will refuse to abide by the suggestions of the doctor. So it is really grotesque but it is the most evident manifestation of this idea of moderation as the basis for a healthy marriage and relationship. Okay, uh, Emilio and Grazia had been lovers before Emilio got married. Once Emilio got married, he uh, discontinued his relationship with Grazia and 
Grazia is uh, Ferrucci's wife, as we said. By the end of the play, Emilio and Carlo together will force Rossetti to marry Elena because Elena herself, as a widow who wants more and more attention from Carlo, is an element that is socially disruptive. Okay? So, this to introduce the characters and the themes at the same time. The automobile in this comedy, as usual, is not simply means of transportation. It's the source of entertainment, right? You go for a car ride for the thrill of it. It is part of what makes you elegant or a model of elegance. So it is an extension of your public self. If you're seen with a powerful automobile, people are supposed to think more of you. And that is part of the culture of the period uh, of the movement which emerged in France and then spread to Italy and other places called decadentism, where the idea was that aesthetics can be driving the assessment of value of an experience or anything else. That is to say, the beauty of the automobile is a value in itself beyond the function of the automobile. Although we find many aristocratic characters, right? Angelo, Ferrucci, Rossetti are all aristocrats, right? They have a, an aristocratic title. In this play as well, as we've seen in other novels from the period, we find this idea of natural aristocracy or natural leadership. That is to say, even Emilio and Carlo show leadership. They don't need an aristocratic title to be recognized as leaders in society because they have the natural skills to support their claim to leadership. In here you find a few notes about Italy during this period and the history of Italy in the period immediately before the time of the play, which you can read by yourself. And it's important to place into this context the emphasis that you find in the play on values such as stability, order, peace, harmony, in society, right? But why is this being emphasized? Because overall, the Italian nation needs to pursue progress and growth, and there is allegedly no progress and growth unless you can ensure enough stability, harmony, order, and peace in society. And therefore, the technology of the automobile is just one disruptive element that needs to be controlled as much at this point as other disruptive uh, practices such as having an affair outside of marriage. In terms of social education, we found the element of what makes you a modern professional, what is a good lawyer, what is a bad lawyer, Clearly a good lawyer in a modern society is a lawyer that works with all kinds of customers, not just those that people in society find acceptable. And a typical concept of this period, which you find reflected in the representation of marriage and relationship, is the idea of hygiene as part of society. So a healthy marriage, what is it? It's a marriage based on mutual understanding between husband and wife and based on moderation in everything, including love, including sex. And in general, in order to maintain a certain level of social hygiene, you need to maintain a healthy balance in life which means no obsessive attachments, whether it be love, passionate, romantic relationship, sex, and no manias, including manias for technology. 
Even religion is a danger if it is not pursued with moderation. Yes, um, please. Is it somewhat of a contradiction that Emilio is sort of lauded for his ideals in moderation? He pulls a somewhat conservative view of love when it comes to the affection that his wife showers him in? No, no, it's still part of moderation, right? So it, 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 it is, the character is modeling the idea that even within marriage, love should be applied in moderation. When it comes even to public display of affection in this case, but in general, that is to say that you cannot be an efficient member of society if love, even when you're married, occupies too big a space or too much of your time, right? You cannot be a model member of society if you are focusing too much on your wife or husband. That's the idea, right? That there is, there has to be moderation within the relationship so that you can balance your private life, your public life, your private duties towards your spouse and your public duties towards society in general, the government, the nation, etc. Right? Yeah. Although could it be So I mean you can you don't have to embrace this view. Well, you yeah. can call it contradictory uh, in, in modern terms, as long as you understand the logic that is at work in here based on the ideology of the times. Oh yeah, I, I understand that. I was wondering if it's sort of moderation as sort of a middle ground between more radical views of love and the more conservative notions of absolute celibacy, or if more religious views during this time actually mandated that a couple be completely codependent to each other. Not at all. Um, but what, what happens during this period, keep in mind that the unification of Italy had taken place against the will of the church, because the church was part of a state that occupied a considerable portion of central Italy, and therefore the church, through diplomatic efforts and international alliances, had slowed down or opposed the process of unification of Italy, to the point where, in 1870, the Italian army had to attack the city of Rome and break through the defenses and fight a battle uh, at Porta Pia. Um, and uh, they invaded the city of Rome, and um, the Pope was relegated to what is today the city of the Vatican. Right? But the Pope considered himself a prisoner there, having gone from a substantial territory to one of the smallest states on, uh, on earth, right? Limited to uh, Castel Sant'Angelo and the Vatican palaces and St. Peter, right? You, you may have visited that area. So the new national, the, the propaganda of the new nation was moving away from a lot of religious values in social practices trying to separate church and state as much as possible. And they were dealing with the issue of strong, loyal Catholics in Italy not supporting the new government because of what they had done to the church and the pope. Because not only the church and the pope lost the state they occupied in central Italy, but after that, the Italian state seized a lot of properties of the church. For example, uh, my middle school and high school were in a building that used to be a convent, and after the unification of Italy, the property of that convent was seized by the Italian state, and the building was turned first into uh, a military barrack, uh, uh, and then uh, into a school, right? And no reparations were made up until the 1920s operations happened with an agreement between the church and the state under Benito Mussolini in 1928. Okay, so 
the idea that even something like marriage should be taken in moderation, even love within marriage, or the idea that even faith has to be taken in moderation, cannot drive your life, cannot dominate your life and your relationships, is the secular response or the secular alternative to the traditional Catholic models that had been in place in Italian society in one way or the other for several centuries. Is that more clear? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let me skip and move on a little bit. So in terms of social hygiene, the marriage, marriage in society is necessary and works if the people inside the marriage are enabled by this relationship to operate at peak efficiency in society, as members of society. If they spend too much time together, then it is not a healthy marriage because it is not conducive to a healthy society. Because in a healthy society, you don't spend too much time with your spouse, and this way you have time to commit not only to your profession, which is key to society, but other social activities that advance the growth and the progress of society overall. That is why there is no condemnation of, no moralistic condemnation of a sexual extramarital affair in this play. For example, Emilio doesn't think any less of her of his friend Renata for going out for a romantic trip uh, outside of Florence. The idea is that any excessively intense relationship is damaging to society because it's taking too much of the time and energies of the persons involved in it. And in fact, one of the paradoxical situations that we find in the play is that Carlo, who's having a, uh, an affair with Elena, complains that Elena wants too much of his time, that the demands of a lover, of a mistress, are more than the demands of a wife. That the relationship, the bourgeois, kind of not excessively romantic relationship between a husband and a wife is better than a passionate relationship with a lover. Okay? And that the intensity of an extramarital affair is damaging socially, psychologically, because of all the attention that goes into maintaining that kind of relationship, and physically, because the idea is that excessive sex will have repercussions as well, right? If anything, because all of your energies go there, and therefore you're not operating at peak efficiency when it comes to your social duties, when it comes to your professional duties. Okay? So the idea of a balance and the disruption caused by technology is placed within this ideology, where you have duties, some duties towards your spouse and family, some duties to you, towards your professions, but also duties towards your overall society or nation, government, etc. Okay. And in, in some way, these, this kind of ideology will morph into the ideology of fascism. Okay. One of the themes in here is the idea that if you enhance mobility, then promiscuity could be one of the consequences. In the case of Renata, the fact that by getting on the car with the playboy Rossetti, she's taken out of town. The idea is that any woman that is removed from a place where people know her, and therefore there is self-censorship because of that, 
makes the automobile more dangerous. Another example that is provided in the play is that Lina, who's absolutely faithful to Emilio, takes the train by herself to go from Florence to Rome to visit her mother. And keep in mind, again, that is called the nun because she's so religious. But then other people around her will be suspicious of this trip because she went by herself. And what if she stopped between going from Florence to Rome? What if she stopped at another town and had an affair there? Who could discover? Who could know about it? So mobility, enhanced mobility, means more independence, but also can lead to more promiscuity. And there are other characters confirming that. Okay. And a lot of metaphors that belong to the economic system, right? The ideologies of modernity, the values of modernity, influence the language, inform the language of the play, okay? And in terms of the effect of the technology itself, it has to be placed within the view of female biology during this time, which is why I have included a section on this pseudo-medical phenomenon known as hysteria, to which a lot of importance was assigned in medical books and books of criminology during the time to make you understand how the reactions by Renata to the compromising situation she found herself when taken a ride out of town mimic the symptoms of hysteria to show that the technology of the automobile is more dangerous, even more dangerous for women because they are, uh, they respond to that kind of stimulation, of physical stimulation, because the automobile has much more of an impact on them based on their biology. Of course, this is all based on the beliefs of medicine and sociology during this time. Okay. So let me switch briefly to the sonnets and then we'll watch the video. No, in fact, maybe it's time to talk about the video and I can talk about the sonnets next week. Okay, so an adventurous automobile trip is one of the most significant silent films of this period. As I said, a version of it was made in 1904, and then a new version, an extended version, was produced in 1905. The director was a Frenchman by the name of Georges Méliès, and he was one of the pioneers of cinema in general, and especially in France. He had experience with theater, he had been an illusionist, which explains uh, the insistence on uh, special effects and when cinema came around by 1896 he was producing films uh, and between 1896 and 1913 he produced 500 films some of them as short as one minute initially and others longer than 10 minutes these films however brief required a lengthy production process, so much so that among the inventions and the techniques that he pioneered was the storyboard, to produce a storyboard uh, to show the various scenes and the camera angles. So in 1904, Georges prepared a show that was hybrid, as you find in here. It was presented at Le Folie Berger in Paris. Part of the show happened on the stage, so there were scenes with actual actors and actresses on the stage in front of the spectators. 
and then other scenes would be projected on the screen. Okay, so it was a combination of a live show and a film. It was successful and a new version was produced, an extended, expanded version, which was distributed even in American theaters. The problem was that all of the productions by Méliès were very expensive. He was trying uh, to uh, impress the public with uh, no special effects, and usually he would end up spending more than he could recover with profits generated by these films. And by World War I, he was almost penniless, forced to sell his production <coughs> house. During the war, the production house itself in Montreal, in the suburbs of Paris, was occupied and used by the French army. So some of these films were destroyed by the military who recycled the material, and others after the war were destroyed by himself uh, because he was forced to sell everything he had, including all the films, to a company that is still in existence, Pathé. And uh, before this happened, he tried to set fire to a number of those film roles. Uh, so of those more than 500, there must have been much more, many more than 500, only about 200 have survived and even this film has not survived in its entirety. After the war, in the 1920s, he got married with his longtime uh, lover who was an actress, but they both ended up selling trinkets and candy in a kiosk in Paris. And at the end of the 1920s, a journalist uh, rediscovered him as a pioneer. Uh, they gave him a, an official uh, recognition in France, but he remained poor until the end of his life, which happened in 1938 when he was in his 70s. So, a pioneer of cinema and invented many techniques, different kinds of editing, etc. So, the film we are going to watch as I said before, includes nine scenes, but the original, which was lost, must have included at least 10 and maybe as many of 12 scenes. At the beginning of the video that we will see, which is completely silent, we find the King of Belgium, King Leopold II, who's outside the Paris house, a theater, and possibly in the scene that preceded this, the king uh, expressed his desire to go from Paris to the French Riviera, to Monte Carlo, but the trip by train during that time took more than 10 hours, and he finds an inventor who has created a very fast automobile, that will take him and the king to Monte Carlo from Paris in only two hours. And the video, the film, is the story of this trip. Along the way, after they've said their goodbyes to the people outside the Paris house, on their way to Monte Carlo, they stop at a garage to refuel, and there is a comic accident whereby a policeman is uh, hit by the car and completely flattened to the ground. And you'll see what the aftermath of that. They go through the French hill and they hit the local mailman and the mail is flying everywhere. They cross the Alps, even though you don't exactly need to cross the Alps uh, to get to Monte Carlo from Paris, but that's the imagination, right? The imaginary part of the film. They go through a customs office or station, keep in mind that even traveling within the same country during that time you had to pay custom fees entering towns. Yes? So is this a more comic adaptation yes. of the way we discussed earlier? It's a comedy about the ills of the technology of the automobile. Because the pattern that is followed in every scene is that 
you see people going about their lives, doing commerce or just strolling, walking through a city, and then the automobile arrives, and by the time the automobile leaves the scene, there is chaos. Is so the idea is still technology equals chaos and lack of control, meaning it is difficult to control the technology. Is the 1904 film that this was inspired by still intact, or is it too glossy? No, we only have the 1905 <coughs> version, some of the 1905 version, and we have, we have it in black and white. We also have less film, not the entire film, colored, uh, because he would often color his films, which was done by hand which made the production of these films incredibly expensive, as you can imagine. Even for a five minute, 10 minute silent film, to paint all of the frames would take a long time and a lot of manpower, okay? And so you have the idea, at the end of the video, they'll arrive in Monte Carlo, and there too, people are happy, are about to welcome uh, the king and this, and this inventor, but, once the car gets there, it's just distraction and mayhem. And you find other notes in here which you can review. Okay, keep in mind, this is the narrative pattern. The scene is set with normal productive activities. The car first gets the attention of the people, then chaos and disruption follows. And even after the automobile has left, sometimes chaos continues. So there is a negative representation of the disruption caused by the automobile, and they fade from one scene to the next. And this is available on YouTube, so you can review it whenever you want. Okay, let me get to the link in here. This is the hand-painted version. And this is it. Some of the characters on the stage were celebrities of the time, like the tall man. And there are other performers. So this would be the inventor and the king who come there to announce their trip. <coughs> And are greeted because people know who they are and as I said especially the people coming by are all celebrities from the time which has come on practice in theaters and of course the car is fake right they use a wooden model to represent that this is a performer And of course, light music would have been added in the theaters when people went to see this. The music itself was not part, there was no soundtrack in the role of film. And they leave, right? So this is the beginning. Now, the narrative pattern that I was discussing starts here. People are going about their activities outside of this garage. There is order in life and society before the arrival of the automobile. Notice a reference to race cars on top of the garage, a reference to the bicycle, which is also noticeable as another kind of machine producing speed. The car arrives, right? Clearly they're pushing it on the stage. They need to refuel. Big fennel. And this was common. Gas stations, let me stop if you have a question. Keep in mind that gas stations with pumps did not exist in most locales during this period. What you would find, what you would purchase is tin cans with gasoline in it and you would add them to the car. And the people selling these cans would sometimes add water to make more money off of it uh, to unsuspecting drivers. Your question? I was just gonna ask if this is one of the first uh, political satire films ever made. Since no, it well, is on a living political figure. Oh, because because it's a king, 
that is being uh, portrayed as uh, a ridiculous character bringing chaos. No, I wouldn't say so. Sometimes we imagine the past to have uh, an excessive degree of censorship when in fact it was possible to make fun of even the king of Belgium. Oh, yeah, no, I just so no, I wouldn't say this is the only, uh, oh, not the only place place where we see the, that. One of the first film political satires. Probably not, I would say, without uh, being able to indicate another example, but no, any f not in film, surely in theater, this would have been possible. So, of course, there is a lot of attention, right? People gather because of, there is the king of Belgium, which was an international celebrity, and because of the automobile. They are dressed up with fur, fur coats because the car is an open top car, and therefore a lot of cold air. And now they're cranking the car, and this is where the disruption begins. Instead of putting the low gear, they put reverse, and they flatten the policeman. This is one of the most common special effects produced with editing during this time. Because if you go back, you see that there is actually a character, an actor, playing the part of the policeman, and then you see him flattened. It's simply because they edited so carefully that you don't see where they stopped and then placed this uh, puppet to replace the policeman. It's called a splice cut, and they used it a lot. Okay, but trying to rescue the policeman by inflating him back to his shape with a pack. So they leave anyway. But first, they pump him back to life. But even this is not controlled carefully. So disruption continues even after the car has left because the policeman is inflating too much and will explode. Now we're back with the actor. And now the guy has exploded. This is the scene after the automobile has left. The automobile goes through the hills. Now we have a peaceful male man who will be the next victim. And this, I believe, was the director himself. There we have it. And we continue. Altogether, it's about 10 minutes which is fine for the standards of the time. And notice the insistence on, on the fact that chaos produced by the automobile remains on the screen even after the automobile is left. They go through mountains resembling the Alps with different kinds of effects. They look cartoonish, but everything was done with models, right? And this is the custom station, right? As I said, even traveling through the same nation of France, you had to go through customs and pay fees. 
And this is an example. There are people who are bringing stuff into the town and they're being checked by the custom officers in case they bring products that are taxable. But this is part of the regular activities. The officer comes by, you understand that he's the officer, the chief, by the way he treats the others. And then the car comes through. with the result that you can imagine. And we have another man exploding, becoming a victim of the automobile, and you see the confusion before it fades out completely, the confusion that remains on the screen. Here you have an open-air market on the French Riviera, as you see from the fake background, car comes by, the market falls apart, and order is not easily restored. In fact, you have this big riot that follows, meaning that the consequences of the arrival of the technologies can be felt for a while. Then the car goes through a peaceful village, who are going about their business, but they have to escape because the car is coming, and distraction follows. First example, big commotion, and then there is this courtyard with various kinds of activities, people drinking, working, and the car comes in to destroy everything. In here, people are putting tar, which was the time's equivalent of asphalt. And this is a reference to an actual event, the tarring of the roads leading to Monte Carlo. We have the palms, so we know we're in the French Riviera. And all of this was shot in the garden owned by the director. You have a cart bringing the tar to put on the lawn, so people are going about their jobs. It'll be over soon, in a couple of minutes. And the car will arrive to bring distraction and explosions in here as well. And even after the car has left, it's the continuation of our chaos. And now the last scene, the arrival of the car in Monte Carlo, with the people ready to welcome the heroes who came from Paris in just two hours. But they have something else coming, because the car will go up and destroy people. And now the car will come to disrupt all of this. 